Belgioso Cheese is a family-owned and operated company specializing in artisan Italian cheese making. Using only natural ingredients and fresh, local Wisconsin milk, Master Cheesemakers handcraft a full line of exceptional cheeses, guided by a commitment to quality and a respect for tradition. Ask your distributor about Belgioso's award-winning fresh mozzarella, burrata, ricotta, mascarpone, American grana, and parmesan. At Belgioso, every cheese is a specialty. Hi, and welcome to this week's episode of Extra Serving, a Nation's Restaurant News podcast. I am your host, Holly Petrie. Today, we're going to be talking about the slew of female CEOs that were appointed this week. We're very happy about that. In an industry that's flooded with white male CEOs, seeing several female CEOs in one month is unusual, yet alone one week. Apologies, somebody's yelling outside my apartment. Um, that's contrasted with companies like Yum Brands and Starbucks, who are pulling back on DEI goals after threats from conservative groups armed with lawyers. Is this the end of the pipeline for female and people of color in the restaurant industry C-suite? Next, we're going to be talking about a blast from the past, the metaverse. Two years ago, you couldn't read a single story that did not mention the metaverse, and that's all but gone away in the past several months. This week, Starbucks announced it would be ending its beta test of Odyssey signaling the end of the most in-depth metaverse test in the restaurant industry. What is the newest marketing and technology trend now that we've moved on from the metaverse? Finally, we're going to be talking about wings. Chains like Applebee's and Popeye's are focusing on their wing offerings, which is no surprise because Americans love wings. But are these larger companies trying to ride on Wingstop's coattails or are they trying to compete? This week's interview is Marshall Scarborough, Bojangles Vice President of Menu and Culinary Innovation. And now it's time to introduce my lovely co-hosts. I'm Leanne Zinsmeister. I'm the Managing Editor of Nation's Restaurant News. Well, welcome, guys. Everybody who's watching, Alicia has new glasses, so pay attention to her lovely eyes. You're just readers, and <laughs> I have 50 pairs of readers because I'm that old. <laughs> We're used to the blue ones where this is a nice change. <laughs> just just making sure everybody checks out the video so you can see. <laughs> Special video version. Um, all right. So what do you guys think about just in general, the news that's been going on this week? I mean, we saw uh, this morning, we record on Thursdays, uh, Rob Lynch was named CEO of Shake Shack. So it's been a really big week for executive appointments, especially CEOs. Um, we saw a lot of women, which, you know, is a nice surprise uh, being named CEO, but I don't know what it is about this week. Like it's the first week of spring. Maybe people are like, let's change with the equinox. Like, I don't know what, what? <laughs> it. that you, you cracked the code. You cracked the code. It's been a lot of fun. Honestly, I think we've had a CEO change every single day this week so far. And to yesterday um and three of them have been women so that's a ratio uh that i've never seen before uh and am delighted by uh so it's been a fun week like chasing the news getting it up there um i know alicia's had conversations with at least one of the new ceos and we've got more uh planned so it's lots of lots of good stuff and luckily they did it this week and not like three weeks ago when everyone was reporting earnings and <laughs> We had a little gap in our schedule and the restaurant companies well, decided to be nice sure. to us. <laughs> and that, that could very much be the, the, the timing of it. We're in between quarters. Um, you know, it, it is Women's History Month, uh, which is, <laughs> makes it really exciting. But you know, we're going into WFF next week, too, which is the largest um, organization uh, working toward, you know, gender equity in this industry. And I, I don't know if there's, you know, if the announcements were planned thusly or, or not, but it, it's certainly exciting. And, you know, I, I think it's really important to understand that the three of us here on this call who've been covering this industry for years, this is, it, it's anomalous. It's still very anomalous. So I think this week was particularly exciting because at the end of the day, there's still less than 20% of women in any C-suite role in this industry. And so to have the influx of news like we had in which all of them, except for Rob Lynch, um, you know, were, were, were women, it, it, we don't want this to be news, but it certainly is, is news. Um, and, and I think it's cool because, you know, over 60%, 65% are of the frontline workers in this industry are women. So 
representation certainly matters. Well, and you know, this kind of comes in the light of Starbucks and Yum Brands, you know, pulling back on their DEI goals. They were tied to executive compensation since 2020, 2021. Um, and now, you know, conservative groups are threatening that and saying you're discrimination, you're discriminating against white men and you're providing this handicap for them. And, you know, we're not saying whether that's right or wrong. Um, we're just saying this is what's happening. Um, but it's really like this is going to impact the pipeline of women who are people of color, all these people who are trying to rise to these roles that they may have had all these roadblocks for for decades. Um, so ooh, that is a really annoying horn. Um, so, you know, there's this just kind of image of the fact that the C-suite is getting better, has been getting better, and now is, <laughs> oh my God. Are you putting on the sidewalk? What is happening over there? <laughs> New York City, baby, New York City. Sorry. Um, so there's this, you know, what kind of happens to the pipeline now that we're seeing people react to this, like that these DEI goals, like can can companies still have these goals internally that are not tied to executive compensation? Is it something they can keep internal? I mean, there's public companies, there's a lot to talk about there, but I mean, what are your thoughts, both of you on this new kind of stance that restaurants are taking or have to take? Um, lately, and I don't know if you want, want, want to go, but you know, this is just such a, it's such an interesting conversation right now because we are less than four years removed from this really ambitious movement uh, in the wake of George Floyd's murder. And, and uh, a lot of restaurant companies were, you know, on the front rows of those ambitions. And um, it, the pendulum does seem to be swinging back a, a little bit. And, you know, it, it's, I think many, if not most of us have opinions on this, but it, our opinions really don't matter. What matters is what, what is happening and what that means. Um, and there is pullback on language. We saw this week, like you mentioned, Holly, you know, Starbucks is pulling back on, um, you know, compensatory uh, bonuses tied to this. They're also shifting away from specific language moving from the word representation to talent um that to me seems the most shocking um you know i think that adjustments being made um from a bonus structure are different than the it, like you said the internal stuff that that fills that pipeline uh, and aspires to a more diverse pipeline um it, it, you know I think that is one thing, but pulling away from the very semantics uh, that underscore why some of this is probably necessary, particularly in our industry, is a little concerning. Representation matters, and I that might be an opinion. Um, you know, I, I I am out, so I can say that from my you know from my lived experience that representation matters and we just talked about how exciting it was for the three of us you know specifically to see all of the ceo news this week because we just don't see that um you know we see it with the servers and the cashiers and but who's making the decisions for the servers and the cashiers that are about 65 percent women um we, we see it with things like uh you know um a couple of chains have been sued recently because they're not providing adequate spaces for breastfeeding. Um, Childcare is this pervasive issue that continues. It's a broken rung. All of this stuff comes into play and it all comes back to the, the representation. Now, I think that, you know, I, I think again, the, the pendulum is swinging a little bit. And what, what's interesting to me is that we are starting to see some very subtle, maybe scrubbing or retrenchment on these things. We're seeing positions uh, being eliminated or uh, downgraded quietly. Um, departments being maybe cut a little bit here. This is, this is something that happens whenever companies go through, you know, just general CapEx uh, ex exploration is, it, you know, this tends to be first on the chopping block. And I don't think that is new. Uh, what's new is how far perhaps the pendulum did swing 
in 2020 and now where it's kind of coming back to. Um, I, I do think it's also important to note that many companies still have DEI goals and this company is still striving toward toward that from the companies at least that I cover. You know, um, Chipotle is a really good example here. You know, they want to increase their diversity pipeline to about 60% in its internal, uh, you know, in, internal ranks. That being said, they used to have a C-level executive for this, and now the DEI function transitions up to the CPO. So things like this, I think, are working the, the you know, I think they're working themselves out. I would like it to be a little bit more aggressive, but that's my, you know, personal, uh, <laughs> that is my personal opinion. But we have a ton of organizations, you know, working to support these companies to make sure this conversation doesn't swing all the way back. The lawsuits are not you know, they are probably driving some of this. Um, and that has become really crystal clear. But at the end of the day, these are public companies. Um, I, there is precedent, but there's precedent on both sides. I came from higher education. You know, you're pulling, you're pulling from public funds there. There's a bit different of a conversation there. I think the private sector will be a little bit more insulated um, you know, in terms of this. And Starbucks is still forging forward with this just because they adjusted their you know, their executive uh, incentives around this doesn't mean they're not still pushing the envelope here on this specific topic. And, um, you know, I, I just think the conversation might be adjusting itself now. Yeah, I think what's interesting is, and Starbucks is the company that really made a splash this week with its language changes. Um, but what's interesting to me is that Starbucks does still have explicit d &I goals. Um, and they're still written into the compensation structure. Um, it was just like, it's, it's different now. It's still there, but it's different. <laughs> and on the one hand, it feels like it could be, you know, lip service in a good way for us, like lip service to the companies that are upset about DNI and like, you know, suing the companies and whatnot. But on the other hand, like Alicia said, like this is a pendulum and I don't want this like one, what looks like a little minor like change in language to become the first step toward like fully repealing these things because I think that could be a really slippery slope. So I'm concerned to see the change at all, but I'm hopeful that maybe it'll just be like this one change. Now, of course, it's a different story at companies that are, you know, eliminating d &I roles and departments um, and folding it all into human resources and, you know, CPOs. But um, yeah, it's like, I think your comparison to a pendulum was perfect, Alicia, because yeah. these feel like the very first steps towards something but, more nefarious. But, you know, I, and, and I think everything was really well intended in 2020. There was a lot of emotion, not just because of COVID, but because of the you know, because of the murder of George Floyd and then everything, you know, I live in, in Louisville and we had Breonna Taylor that year too. And it was highly intense. And um, I think the companies were right to do by their people uh, with, with all the ambitious um, objectives and, and, and statements and, and all of that. There's always pushback when something goes that ambitious though. There's pushback on everything when something goes that hard. And, you know, I, I cannot remember, and please forgive me, I probably should have done be much better homework here. It may have been Howard Schultz. There was a company that was sued for um, its DEI, um, its DEI work. And, and the executive said, there are plenty of other companies that you can go and spend your investment money with but we're going to, we're going to keep doing this. And I, it was a restaurant company and forgive me for not knowing that. And it, it just, it, it goes back to that private public sector, right? So the pendulum is swinging, but the, the, the private sector that we cover has, has more leverage to be, to insulate itself if it so chooses. And I think many of the companies that we cover will so choose. And I think it's a mandate, you know, for the companies to choose it simply because of our, our workforce. Um, you know, almost 50% of our of food service employees are minorities. And, and you know, that's compared to 38% of the general population. And, and those are staggering numbers. And we have to reflect, our decision makers have to reflect, you know, those frontline workers. That became crystal clear uh, during COVID. So I think that, I think this industry will work itself out and continue to embrace DEI 
um, in, in a in a way that will be um, you know that will that will be appropriate for for our workforce. Well, you know, I was talking with uh, Joanna about this for an episode of First Bite, and we were talking a little bit after, too, about it, um, is that, you know, these companies make these really public goals, and we saw several companies over the past few years push back the date of when they wanted to accomplish these goals, so they were already a little iffy on it. Um, they're ambitious goals. Ambitious, though, you think it's really that hard to find competent women and people of color. i whatever. But um, it's, I was talking with Joanna and I was like, it's nice to have these companies make this big stand and have these goals, but like they could still do it internally. Like there's no one stopping them from internally hiring women, hiring people of color to support the pipeline without having these goals. They can just do it. They could do it on their own. Like, and I don't know why it needs financial compensation tied with it. Like, just do it. It's the right thing to do. And so we were talking about that. And I was being a little like, being a little like Alicia, like very optimistic. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> oh, yeah, no. That's your new nickname. Just, like, just do it. Like, it's not hard. It's not hard to hire qualified people. White men are not the only qualified people in the country. Um, they're actually a minority of the country at this point. But it's like, there's plenty of other people who are qualified. Well, the, the Pollyannishness of that, I think, needs to be paused <laughs> because, <laughs> because the, you know, that, that certainly is easier said than done because at the end of the day, women especially and a lot of uh, minorities are impacted disproportionately by that broken rung. Women have to leave the workforce in, in higher percentage numbers because of child care. Um, you know, uh, there, there's just systemic things that have broken the pipeline in a way for women and minorities that haven't impacted men uh, historically. That, I think, is starting to change, and I think there will be a, a better pipeline from which to choose in, you know, maybe five or ten years. Maybe we're starting to see that this week. I don't know. But I think, you know, I think right now is when we're starting to see the, uh, the tide flow a little bit more because of that historical um, setback that we've had to, the hurdles that we've had to have. Well, and this is why we as a publication also talk to and about general managers and franchisees so much, because like Alicia said, like this industry as a whole is mostly minorities and we need to be building people up from the bottom. Um, and so I think we've seen, you know, in the past several years, a huge improvement in terms of equity at the, and it's not perfect, but equity at some of the lower levels in the industry. And we need to make sure that we're continuing to promote um, and to support women and people of color at every level of the industry, because that's how they become the qualified folks who can join the C-suite um, and be at that level. Exactly. And, and I think, you know, to that point, Liam, that's what, that's why we're talking about this sort of macro pushback right now. Is that pushback, that threat of, you know, uh, of a lawsuit, for example, uh, that threat of uh, negative public perception, any of that, is that going to hinder the progress that has been made? You know, I pulled McDonald's diversity snapshot from 2022, which is the most recent one they had. And I was pretty impressed in, in, in 2022, they had 43% of their senior director and above level positions were women. And that was up from 37% in 2020. So this is a really good case study of progress being made. 43%, eh, it's not quite up to that 60% of the frontline leaders, but, you know, that's a six percentage movement in just two, two years at the senior director and above level that is, you know, impacted by that so-called broken rung. Um, so I guess the question here that none of us are able to answer is, will the pushback that, that we're talking about, will that stagnate or even hinder, you know, some of, some of those numbers? Uh, who knows? We'll see. I think we, as an industry, as a group, as, you know, journalism in general, need to do a better job of educating people on this broken rung, because I think a lot of people don't understand why DEI is important, why you need to help these groups of people, because they have been marginalized for a long time. They have all these issues when they're trying to move up in their careers and people don't 
like it doesn't click to a lot of people. And so that's why these lawsuits are coming up because they think I'm being impacted by this, but they don't realize that people have been impacted outside of them in ways that they could never comprehend. And I think that there needs to be a better education on that. So that way, and it's not, it's not only up to us, it's up to honestly everyone. It's, it's a general education that we need to give more of that people just need to understand the dynamics when it comes to having a job, just having any job that, you know, there's advantages and disadvantages that people have invisible advantages. And it's just, you know, people just need to be more educated on that. And I don't know how to do that. I don't have an answer. Um, but I think it's important for our society to be educated on that. Yeah, I, access access is an, is an important um, piece of that. Access to capital, access to education, access to experience. These are the things, when we talk about the pendulum swinging, these are the things that are starting to swing in favor of some of those groups, those marginalized groups that have not had that access, historically speaking. And, you know, the pendulum started swinging a little bit more when we started having these conversations about why affirmative action is a thing, um, you know, a decade or so ago. Um, but, you know, it all comes back to that, like you said, Holly, that, that uh, continued you, you can't educate yourself without talking or communicating about things and understanding lived experiences of people who may not have had access to things in the, in the past, or they came from, you know, um, uh, generational poverty and are trying to move past that. That's a big, that's a big deal. A lot of things in this industry, especially if you want to become a franchisee, uh, require uh, a significant access to cash. And for someone who grew up in generational poverty, that would never really even be on the radar. Um, and, and historically speaking, that, you know, that, that has been a big roadblock to a lot of this ownership in, in the industry. So, yeah, absolutely has to do with continued um, understanding of what the roadblocks have been historically and, and why. why. Why have they been there? Nobody's, you know, I, I, nobody's pointing fingers, this is your fault, white person white man, <laughs> but you know, the, it, it, it's important to understand. And the broken wrong, you know, is a, is another good example, not just access to capital for minorities, but the broken wrong for women. Why, why are women disproportionately on the hook for childcare? Or, and now, you know, again, in my own lived experience, elderly care, you know, I'm a sandwich generation. It's real hard. It's real hard to work. <laughs> um, you know, but just to have a Gen Alpha at home and to have, a, a, you know, aging parents to care for, and that just falls, it tends to fall more on women than it does men. And it's a historic thing at, that we are still working our way out of men, you know, were the primary breadwinners up until the 70s, 80s, and we're generationally working our way out of that. It's a slow, slow pendulum, Leanne. You said the pendulum, but that is a slow moving pendulum. All right. Well, I feel like we could talk about this all day. Um, we have a lot to say and it's a very interesting issue, but you know, I, I feel like we should move on. Um, so <laughs> Alicia's like, no, I want to talk about this forever. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There, I could, I, there could be tears if I kept talking. About it. <laughs> I don't Nobody know. That'd make for a really good social clip. I kind of, yeah. I kind of want to see that happen. <laughs> Nobody needs that. Nobody needs it. Okay, so, so that's a street cleaner now. So that's that's that noise uh, that's happening uh, on the side. Um, <laughs> it's a real real busy day today uh, in my neighborhood. Uh, so <laughs> we're going to talk about the metaverse. Um, so you know, kind of a name we haven't heard in a while, a phrase we haven't heard in a while. Um, the metaverse. Uh, we were not just us, restaurants everyone was in on the metaverse like that was it when it first came out every restaurant was going in on it roblox was big chipotle had that burrito line like it was it was a lot everybody was buying space in the metaverse they were registering their brand they were trademarking like everything and so the starbucks odyssey which was probably the biggest uh test of a metaverse it was very involved um, it was in a beta test phase for about a year and a half. Um, Starbucks announced they are ending that. 
it is no longer happening. Um, and, you know, Joanna and I were talking about sort of what the future of tech is in the wake of the metaverse and how that really took over conversations and took over tech budgets and marketing budgets and sort of what the future of those look like. Um, and so we were talking and she was just saying it's sort of this tech that helps make the experience better. That's sort of this next tech step. It's not as flashy. It's not as innovative. It's not as cool in marketing, but it's the tech that matters. Um, so like we were talking about the boards where you could see orders, like that's something that customers really want. And so that's sort of the future of where tech is, but are we going to see something flashy again? Like that was such a moment. And I feel like we need another moment. <laughs> I'm sure that we'll see that kind of like flashy tech again someday. But um, what actually struck me when I was thinking about this, and it kind of ties into what we were just talking about with, um, you know, to be an operator in this industry, you need like a certain amount of access to capital. And as a consumer to use some of these tools and like the flashy tech things that restaurants want people to use, like not all consumers have access to the tools that get them into the metaverse, which I'm so relieved I'm never actually going to have to figure out what that is. Um, <laughs> my biggest concern a year and a half ago was learning about the metaverse, and I'm just going to scratch that right off the list now. Um, but, you know, I think like uh, the thing that has the potential right now to be the next big buzzy thing is like the... Um, the Apple Vision Pro, Google Glass, like that kind of artificial reality, but that's something with an even higher point of entry. Um, you know, like right now, only the wealthiest of consumers have those things. And those aren't the consumers who are like, oh yeah, I want to buy this really cool toy so I can play a Starbucks game and maybe win free coffee, you know, or like however it's going to work. Um, like they're using it for other things and they can just pay for their coffee. Uh, so as far as like big flashy tech, I think there's probably going to be a bit of a lull in terms of like the big, you know, especially on the marketing side, because you're right, Holly, like if they, if restaurant companies invest in digital menu boards, um, if they continue to invest in things like AI at the drive through, um, those are things that will have a big impact on the consumer's experience, but not necessarily jack up what the consumer has to pay to experience the brand. Because at the end of the day, if people aren't coming to your restaurant and buying a cup of coffee or a burger or whatever, then like, what are you doing this for? Um, so I think we'll probably go through a phase of practical tech. And then in a few years, and we've talked about, uh, Holly and I have talked about Apple Vision Pro on this podcast before. And I have a theory that, you know, in five years, we're all going to have one, like the same way we all have our matching watches right now, which I thought was ridiculous five years ago. So, um, you know, that's not to say that Apple Vision Pro won't become a huge tool for restaurants to use with consumers, but it's not going to be a thing like in the immediate term. Um, but in the meantime, that means there's all this marketing money to play with and do other things with. Um, and, all, you know, so many there are so many cool marketing trends right now with influencers, um, celebrity collaborations, ridiculous like retail collaborations. Like there's so much you can do with that marketing budget now to create and advertise things that any like or you know like most consumers can access with what they have they don't need special high tech or knowledge or anything to experience your brand yeah i, I think the key word leanne is access I, I wouldn't discount the metaverse quite yet uh, and I, I think that's because i live with a gen alpha and it's funny because when Starbucks drops the metaverse this week, I asked him about, I was like, hey, you ever still play in your, because he's got the Oculus and all that, you ever still play around with that? He's like, yeah, but, you know, he doesn't like it as much as other things, but he knows it, he's familiar with it. And as with everything that's sexy and in tech, it's going to iterate to the point where it could be more um consumable and more accessible for people our age i'm gonna say that just to make myself feel better um <laughs> uh, you know but it, it it underscores the nature of marketing and it's in general and and we've been really diving deeply in, into marketing the past couple of weeks in fact i'm working on a story right now about how there is all this dry powder on the sideline and now it's coming off the sideline this year for the first time in 
you know, three years because it's this year of normalization and all of this stuff. But the metaverse is a per perfect example of like the thrills and the challenges of marketing in general. Shiny objects, uh, new, ch new channels, new tech, new platforms, new use cases, you know, all of it are, are just, they're just part of marketing. And the companies that have the biggest budgets, the so Starbucks's, the so Chipotle's, the McDonald's, they're well, they're well positioned to experiment in those arenas, um, you know, as they did, all three of them did with, you know, with the metaverse, you know, Chipotle was the first brand on Be Real. Do you guys remember Be Real? <laughs> I that was mean, me, like, took a picture all the time, right? I think so. Like, here's what I'm doing people, now. Now, <laughs> see, people still use Be Real. Um, they do. So talk about, like, access to other generations, not a different generation. <laughs> but my roommate is a good, like, seven or eight years younger than me. And so I get some of the, like, interesting upper Gen Z, like, trend stuff. Upper and she still, she still Be Real in all Well, and I, I looked to see what was up with Be Real, uh, you know, explicitly for this conversation. And it has dropped by over 60% since its peak in late 22 which is when I covered Chipotle jumping into Be Real. But again, that it's an experimentation. It's the point of marketing. And, you know, marketing can be scientific in terms of, of KPI measure, measurement and everything. But a lot of times it's also throwing spaghetti against the wall to see what sticks. And that's all Starbucks did here. You know, that doesn't mean it, that their metaverse um, exploration was a failure. In fact, it probably was the opposite. A hell of a lot of people were talking about it. So, and investment dollars in marketing because of these quickly evolving channels and objects and so forth, they always shift in, in, in marketing. So what's next? You know, we've talked to several marketers lately and asking them that you know, social video is huge. In fact, linear and streaming, I read a story, I think it was earlier this week in the Wall Street Journal about linear and streaming, streaming platforms should be concerned about this trend. Because the younger generations, young Gen Z, Gen Alpha, and I see this at my dinner table, unfortunately, every night, don't judge my parenting. I do it enough. <laughs> um, they watch their videos on social media. They don't leave. They don't leave those channels. And so that's a, that's a big deal. Um, you know, I think, I personally think we'll see a little bit more of a shift to local marketing, too, um, because it's more intimate perhaps more authentic for brands to be um, deeply cultivating relationships in the communities that they, they operate in. Uh, another example of a pendulum shift. So we go to shiny object on things that are not accessible or relatable to consumers. Well, let's swing that pendulum back to localized things in our community that we can actually relate to. I, I don't know. Um, you know, of course, we're all talking about the co-creator economy and I had the privilege of talking to a couple of major CMO CMOs from major companies this week and both of them um they told me their prediction is that we'll see this co-creator uh, economy continue to evolve where there's like a collision of creators um you know into a wide range of, of platforms like gaming and social media and into loyalty programs and then a collision of these creators into the physical and digital world where there's a triangulation of all of this stuff. So it's going to evolve. So it's like everything it wants. Um, I, I don't know what that means. I, I don't speak the language deeply enough, but again, I, I just don't think we should write off the, the metaverse as a, a whole quite yet. I just think it's going to iterate and I think it will iterate, you know, to, to be more accessible at some point. Um, I don't know, in the next couple of years. What do you guys think about the possibility of a TikTok ban? Because that's, that's where a lot of marketing dollars are going now, is into TikTok, into these creators, into, like I was scrolling today and I saw a Taco Bell ad with Jason Sudeikis. And at first I was like, I love Jason Sudeikis. I love this ad. <laughs> but like, that's a lot of money to spend on like an, a little ad. It was like, 10 seconds. Probably so I mean, this is where Taco Bell. <laughs> <laughs> like this is where a lot of the marketing dollars are going into TikTok and the possibility of it not existing in the US is possible. I don't know what the odds are, honestly. Um, but what do you guys think about this possibility of a ban? I mean, well, I don't know enough about the ban situation to speak on it 
specifically intelligently, but if you ban one thing or do away with it, the kids will land somewhere else very quickly. So I would say if TikTok gets banned, real quick divert like immediate marketing dollars into Instagram and then just keep an eye on the consumer because within two weeks they'll have landed either on Instagram or on some other new video sharing app. Like TikTok, if, if TikTok is banned or goes away, it, like the pla the like idea of it will not. Um, yeah. The consumers aren't going anywhere, so it, yeah, that's yeah. what I, that's what I say. Yeah, and and restaurant operators, that's a perfect point, Leanne. And restaurant operators are going to have to figure it out accordingly. The consumers will figure it out for them. And you're right about Meta being a, a, a beneficiary, a potential beneficiary. Of this, but so is YouTube Shorts, which is growing even faster. And, um, I, you know, my kid watches YouTube shorts and I always think he's on TikTok. I'm like, you're not supposed to be watching TikTok without parental supervision. Because I try. I at least try to be a good parent. <laughs> and he's like, it's not TikTok, mommy. It's YouTube shorts. And I'm like, what the hell is the difference? I don't know. He knows. Um, you know, so I got this little case study in my house and, and, and it, he's not, he's getting the stuff from his social network his fellow nine-year-olds, you know, and just it's where the puck is going, skating where the puck is going. And what I think is, it, it, to Leanne's point, if this is going to hypothetically happen, it's going to be um, detrimental at first for, our, for the short term, but then everybody's going to land elsewhere. There's savvy entrepreneurs that are going to duplicate this here. Uh, um, no question. And restaurant operators are just going to have to continue to be nimble with that ever-changing marketing landscape. Um, it, it's interesting. We're, uh, you know, I've been watching a couple of the, the protests, uh, you know, on Capitol Hill about the potential ban of TikTok, uh, TikTok, and a lot of the protesters are small business owners, and they're they're communicating on signs and verbally that TikTok helped, you know build and grow and sustain my business. And we have covered that. We have covered case studies of small independent, you know, mom and pop shops that have really caught a huge tailwind, you know, the from the power of this marketing channel. Um, so it is an, a necessity to figure it out if and when, or if or when this, this happens. Well, I, I liken it to Twitter or X versus threads. That was, you know, something that came out when Twitter was bought by Elon Musk, a way to kind of counteract it. And it was huge at first. Threads was everything. Those first like 24 hours was insane. And then it sort of... <laughs> <laughs> just just 24 hours, then it stopped. <laughs> then it's, it's, it was done. It was done after 24 hours. But like what I think is interesting because they're all meta products, when I scroll on Instagram now, there's like a static text of threads that is very clunky. You cannot scroll through it. It's very difficult to use, but it's there. And it's reminding you that there are threads. If you want to see more, go to threads. And so um, I think that's kind of the benefit of having this network. And I could see Meta coming out with a competitor to TikTok. They may already be working on it, um, that they could put into their network that shares these shared services, like all those kind of things that we talk about with restaurant industry companies, like, like Yum Brands and RBI, they all share these services. And that could be a benefit to Meta as it moves forward. It's proven to be a benefit, but that could be even, they may even try to buy TikTok. I don't know. But like it, if they roll something else into their portfolio, I feel like that could be a benefit to them and to the consumer who knows how to use these products. They've all become similar. We all know how to like they have the same kind of logic. So I don't know. I could see that happening. I think that's what they were trying to do with Reels. Yeah. But Reels is, is cumbersome too. That, yes. I think the algorithm is what hooks or projects, at, yeah. right? And I think that's why Threads is kind of cumbersome. It's, it's new. It could work its way out. But, you know, and then there's the, if the government is going to mandate a ticket, talk ban then how does the government justify the potential for a meta monopoly here i don't know I, these are these are questions that are well beyond my 
scope of knowledge, but it's things that I think about sometimes. And, you know, I, 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 I guess we'll wait and see what happens, but it's going to have to require, again, restaurants being exceptionally nimble. Well, there's a better interface on TikTok and YouTube shorts. It's more of like a scroll that you could just sit there for hours. Can't do that with reels. Um, so anyways, let's talk about wings. Real, real good uh, swap there. Uh, so <laughs> there were some new wings introduced this week. Applebee's and Popeye's got some new flavors. Applebee's are boneless, um, which according to Brett Thorne, would not make them wings. It would make them chicken nuggets. Um, so, <laughs> Why is he so specific all the time? <laughs> um, so, you know, this is kind of a weird time of year to introduce wings, I feel like. It's not like a, you think wings are like a March thing? Oh, interesting, Alicia. March Madness kicks off today. Oh, yeah, I totally forgot about that because I don't watch sports, but I was... <laughs> I was like, March is so weird to have wings. There's nothing going on. <laughs> Perfectly normal. <laughs> March Madness starts at the end of March. Wouldn't you think it would start at the beginning of March when March well, is? when all the conference play is to get into Mar into the tournament. So. Mm, so the tournament goes to April? Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm, okay. Just a little bit. How long is the... T okay, we'll talk about this later offline because I have a lot of questions about we basketball. Shouldn't, we, we, shouldn't be, we shouldn't be working right now. There's basketball to watch. <laughs> In the morning? Soon, yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, we got uh, wings, we got wings to eat and beer to drink. <laughs> those are two things that I like. Yeah. So I'm okay with that. I I don't need to watch the sport, but I will join you with beer and wings. Okay. <laughs> that was my Sunday, so I would be very happy to do that. Perfect. Nothing says St. Patrick's Day like buffalo wings. Um, so <laughs> very, very Irish. <laughs> yeah, Irish. I don't have a lick of Irish in me, so I'll eat my wings. Uh, so, so I mean, these brands are working on these wing platforms. Popeye's introduced their wing platform, and now they have these two new flavors. Um, and Applebee's has the opposite. They have boneless ones. Um, I mean, Applebee's has been a player in wings for a while. Popeye's is new. Um, but does this mean that there's more of a demand for wings among the population? Like, is this... Beyond March Madness, is this a shift in consumer desires? Yeah, I think it's important to note that Applebee's wings are not new. Um, you know, that it, it is one of the biggest players in the wing space. They, they simply came out with a, a, a really um, a, a interesting promotion this week where they're going to sell uh, wings for 50 cents. Um, they are putting their wings front and center because right now I believe is a sweet spot for wing sales. And it's because we're smack dab in the middle of the Super Bowl and March Madness. Um, and, you know, the Super Bowl is by far the biggest selling day for wings in this country. And Americans, I, I, hold on, I pulled a stat. I pulled a stat for you guys. Where is it? American consumers ate an estimated 1.45 billion, with a B, billion chicken wings for the Super Bowl. What? We're so gluttonous. It's ridiculous. We are gluttonous people. It was all because of Usher. They were like, I need my yeah. chicken wings to watch Usher. Yeah, but, I, you know, I think it, it underscores the love that we, it, it's part of our, we are part of our culture wings are you know sports and wings and um and that that applies to casual dining chains like applebee's it applies to qsrs like popeyes and everything you know in in between i think right now too i would argue this is purely speculative on my part but wings i think also depict value and right now, more consumers are aggressively seeking value. We've seen that on the last round of earnings calls, uh, where lower income consumers particularly are pulling back on their restaurant spend. Wings, they at least had the perception where you can get a lot for not a lot of money. Um, at the Applebee's 50 cent promotion is a perfect example here. And I had the, the privilege of talking to their chief marketing officer, Joel Yashinsky, um, who shares my alma mater, by the way, Bowling Green. Um, and he informed me that, you know, this is not a loss leader. This, these kind of promotions, um, 
you know, are they, they generate profitable traffic because wings are this really tidy little add-on. You know, if you go in and you get your five boneless wings for 50 cents a piece, you're still going to order a drink. You're still going to order a burger. So it's, it's, it's pro- a profitable, pro- profitable promotion for, for the company. Um, and, you know, I, and I think that is a, a really important um, tactic for uh, chains to, to chase right now. If I can add one more thing without uh, usurping Leanne too much on time, um, I, I think another cool thing about Wings that might be happening, right? And, and again, Wings have always been hugely popular in our culture, right? We see this every Super Bowl. But I think the potential here is really interesting right now because as we've talked about extensively, we're seeing this renaissance of sauce, right? And, um, Younger consumers, they love sauce. They love to dip, drench, cover, slap, everything with, with sauce in a way that their, you know, their, um, uh, their predecessors did, did, did not. And, and I think that may be coming in, into play here, you know, um, perhaps a little bit more as these wings provide a perfect canvas for sauces. They always have been, but again, consumers are craving saucier items. So, you know, wings can provide this canvas for perhaps more innovation on sauces. And sauces are low risk. Um, they're low cost. They're operationally simple. Um, you know, and if they can, if they can maybe test a, a new sauce uh, innovation with a wing, perhaps they can roll that out to other platforms. I think there's, I think there's more at play here than perhaps maybe have been has been in the past with our with our love for for wings but again speculation yeah well not just sauce but you can make wings all kinds of different flavors you know the hot chicken item the last few years has been the chicken sandwich and we've seen a lot of innovation with a chicken sandwich but at the end of the day you mostly have a chicken sandwich and a spicy chicken sandwich and then like some odd ducks um with wings, I mean, we're seeing it. I mean, Popeyes has like six or seven wings flavors now, just the wings. And then you consider sauce potential and there's mix and match potential. I mean, there's so much you can do with wings. Like Alicia said, they're operationally inexpensive. They're finger foods, which the kids are really into right now. They just the want to get their hands. Yeah. <laughs> you can't stop me. Um, <laughs> And I think it, like, like Alicia said, you know, wing season happens every year. Wings have always been wildly popular, but it might seem more prominent this year than in the last few because the supply chain has finally mostly stabilized. Um, I mean, God, three years ago, we were talking about how even Wingstop was trying to push other products Mm -hmm. for the Super Bowl. They were like, have you heard about this other thing? It's the, all the rage for the Super Bowl because otherwise they were going to be charging like a million dollars for wings. And anyway, I, so it's just funny. And now that, you know, the supply chain has leveled itself out, it doesn't cost a billion dollars for a dozen wings anymore. Uh, that I, it's, it's a mixture of like, we're just, we're, we're organically seeing it more and just like people are more excited about it. And they're like, oh, we can finally make wings again. Like, what can we do with them? Uh, so there is a lot of like excitement around wings right now yeah but it's also not just like around sports where my parents live there is a wing fest so you like buy a card and you like pay however much money and you walk up and down the street where there's like 60 bars and you just like go to each bar and show your card and you just get like three wings and so people are just like i was sitting with her this summer at it's like august not the time that you'd think you'd want wings but it is packed like Every bar has a huge vat of wings at the door. Their windows are open and they're just passing them out at the window. Uh, I mean, I was sitting eating wings that day too, but just just one, just like one order with some drinks. I'm watching it, <laughs> watching this all happen. And I was just like, this is crazy. Like people love wings. I was a vegetarian for 10 years. The first thing I ate was a buffalo wing when I stopped because I love buffalo wings and i do not like sports so i am a big like buffalo wing at a bar eater i don't even need a drink i'll just sit at a bar and order my buffalo wings like it's 
it's a thing. It's just, it's part of like American culture, not even sport. It's just like, um, I feel like it's one of the most American foods other than like a hamburger Yeah, that like I can think of. It's just so Americana. Well, and wings work all year round because while their main sports events happen in the fall and the winter, you know what you do want in August, Holly, is an ice cold beer. And you know what you want to eat yeah. with your ice cold beer? Wings. <laughs> yeah. And I go ahead. I I didn't know if you were done. I'm sorry. I, I think that's why it's interesting that wings tap is essentially in a category of its own. Yeah. Popeye's sure has wings now. And so does Applebee's. They got all this other stuff over here. You know, and there are smaller Wings players, of course, um, but Wingstop is this, you know, and I, something happened this week um, where Wingstop stock price jumped, like doubled. And it, it's because of the guidance that they have, uh, you know, coming, coming ahead. And so I don't, I think we'll talk about Wings until the cows come home. Is that an appropriate transition? Because they're not cows. They're chicken. Until the chickens walk across the street? The chickens roost. <laughs> but, you know, I think we got to keep an eye on, on Wingstop. And that, that, that underscores just how high this demand. It's never wavered. It's never wavered. <laughs> well, let's talk more about chicken um, with Marshall Scarborough, Bojangles, Vice President and Menu of Culinary Innovation with Brett Thorne. So go ahead and listen to that interview if you haven't had enough chicken yet. Thanks, guys, for joining me. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Holly. Belgioso Cheese is a family-owned and operated company specializing in artisan Italian cheese making. Using only natural ingredients and fresh local Wisconsin milk, master cheesemakers handcraft a full line of exceptional cheeses guided by a commitment to quality and a respect for tradition. Ask your distributor about Belgioso's award-winning fresh mozzarella, burrata, ricotta, mascarpone, American grana, and parmesan. At Belgioso, every cheese is a specialty. Uh, so, nice to meet you, Marshall Scarborough. How are you? Hey, I'm doing well. Nice to meet you, Brett. Uh, and you are the head of culinary, culinary innovation at Bojangles. Yes, sir. Right? And I have to tell you, I, if, if I can change planes in Charlotte, I will, so that I can get a chicken biscuit. Because yeah. Because they are really good. Yeah, thank um, you. And you, how long have you been with Bojangles? Uh, just over four years now. Well, that's been a busy time for you guys, right? You've really worked a lot on your menu and you've made a lot of changes, right? We have. Um, it was an interesting time to join the team at Bojangles. Uh, it was about a month before the pandemic struck. And uh, uh, we, you know, I always joke that I, I was jealous of people that had hobbies during the pandemic. Well, my hobby was uh, working on Bojangles and creating a new menu for our expansion and all kinds of other fun stuff. And, and where were you before that? Uh, I was at Wendy's prior to that. Also a great chain. So <laughs> yes. you guys have done a lot. You've, you've introduced a lot of uh, boneless items and pared down the menu a bit. What, a bit. Why don't you tell us about that, please, sir? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, as part of our expansion strategy and growing into new markets, mm -hmm. um, we spent a lot of time, um, you know, on a strategic approach to um, not only learning from our past attempts at expansion, but also, um, you know, where, what's relevant to our customers today and how do we continue to grow the brand uh, in a, in a way that makes sense. And so, um, you know, a lot of what we found is that, you know, customers are looking for uh, boneless chicken. I mean, there's no denying uh, if you look around the industry, chicken seems to be having a moment right now. Um, consumption's gone way up. Um, supply uh, has been tight. But what we find is that um, customers are all in. And so we created this menu that, you know, where we were staying true to Bojangles uh, Carolina crafted heritage but also uh, bringing forth all the, the delicious flavors um, and modernized menu that people are looking for. And so what are some examples of those, uh, those new items? Yeah, so we, uh, we went all in on um, hand-breaded chicken. And so all the chicken is hand-breaded in these, in, in these restaurants. Um, we've got Bo's chicken tenders, which are just, you know, really good. They're, um, they're pre-marinated with our 
delicious, uh, flavorful seasoning. Um, it's it's really unique. Our we have a special like proprietary blend of chili peppers, and it's funny when we did a lot of the consumer research, people would take a bite, um, you know, unbranded, and they would take a bite and say, "Oh, that tastes like Bojangles," not even knowing who the taste test was for. Um, so that was really cool. And then um, we've got for breakfast, we have Bo's chicken biscuit, which is a delicious hand breaded chicken biscuit served on a made from scratch buttermilk biscuit. And but, but that's uh, like a that's a legacy item, right? Or or did you do something new to it? Um, we we did. Um, so the the legacy item is called the Cajun fillet biscuit. Okay. And what we found is that when you start to venture outside of the South, people think Cajun automatically means spicy, and that's you know it's, we know that's not true. But um, you know, so that's why we. Um, we went all in with this and it's, it's basically a hand breaded version of the legacy product. So was your stuff not hand breaded before it, it, you know, it tastes so looked after and soigné. I mean, what was, yeah. you changed the process of how you put your chicken together. We did, we did. We, uh, we, we switched to a hand breaded platform. Um, we've always hand breaded our bone and chicken, and marinated that in the restaurants with our our chili pepper uh, seasoning, but um, yeah, for going in and expanding to these new markets, um, you know, there's just if you want to compete, uh, then it's you've got to step up your quality game, and that's what we did. So now you're hand breading the boneless items as well. We are. Um, we. Um, we have uh, the chicken tenders, the a sandwich fillet, and the breakfast fillet. Well, as you might have heard, Marshall, there's a there's a labor crunch in the food service industry. There always has been, really, but there certainly is now. Yeah. So that sounds more labor intensive. Does that make it hard as you expand to like get people to come in and hand bread your your boneless chicken? It, it does make it a little bit more challenging. However, um, you know, the customers are rewarding us, right? Um, they notice a difference and they keep coming back. How, how uh, do customers in new markets interact with Bojangles compared to like the traditional Southeastern markets where you guys are? Um, that's a good question. Um, you know, a lot of people um, are really, you know, they, that don't know the brand. Um, are surprised with the fact that we're actually making the food in the back of the house. It's, you know, our biscuits are rolled out every 20 minutes. Uh, we cook the dirty rice from scratch once an hour. Um, you know, we're baking the mac and cheese and it's, it, they just don't expect it from a, a brand that has a drive through. You know, it's, it's weird that, I mean, as you, as you know, as somebody who is a corporate chef at a chain restaurant, that a, a lot of people out there in the general world don't realize that actually there are chefs like develop yeah, absolutely writers. it's not some committee or you know i don't know marketers or food scientists i mean there are food scientists but you know there are actual chefs who are trained and like know what they're doing so I mean, yeah. go ahead well no i mean i was just going to say we have an incredibly passionate team of chefs um it's not just me um, and they all come in, they live and breathe fried chicken, right? We're all, st we're all students of, uh, Southern cuisine and Carolina cooking. But and speaking of which, you also bring in pork chops every once in a while with a pork chop griller, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, we're, we're, our menu has always kind of been formed around, um, what's local to the Carolinas and, you know, the Carolinas are a huge area agricultural producer of pork. And, uh, it's just, you know, Carolina barbecue is all about pork. And, uh, so it just makes sense for us to give our fans the, the pork chop griller. We bring it back. It's, it's a fall item that, um, you know, I get messages all the time from people saying, when are you bringing it back? <laughs> Cause they love it so much. So why then not just add it to the menu? Is it just kind of off brand as a permanent addition or, or what? Yeah. So, um, it's one of those things where, um, the whole point of a limited time offer is to really bring people in and, um, and then we, we, we follow it up with something else that they're going to enjoy. 
So what what are some other uh, LTOs that you've done recently? I know you did a uh, chicken rice bowl, right? We did, yeah. And the chicken and rice bowl just hit that sweet spot. Um, it was incredibly successful for us. Um, you know, you think about it like the time of year, you're looking for that warm comfort meal on the go. Um, if you're coming out of the holidays on a budget, then, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a lot of food for a good price. If you have the new year's resolutions, uh, you know, and, and you're trying to shed some pounds from the holidays, um, it's a, it's a healthier menu item too. So it works. Yeah, you can even, I'm looking at the menu description. You can have grilled chicken on it if you want, or fried chicken, either one. Do you, do, you ha do you have, I should know this, but I don't. Do you have a lot of grilled chicken on the menu? I think of Bojangles as, you know, fried chicken. Yeah, no, good question. So our grilled chicken is probably the best menu item that we haven't really promoted until that chicken and rice bowl. Um, you know, we recently reformulated it during the pandemic and uh, it's tender, juicy, um, you know, it tastes like chicken. Uh, it's one of those menu items that um, doesn't necessarily have our proprietary chili pepper blend in it, um, primarily because, you know, you don't want all your food to taste the same. Makes sense. And uh, is it a big seller, grilled chicken? Um, it's, it's, it, we sell a, a fair amount of it, not as much as our delicious hand breaded fried chicken. I think a lot of people come in wanting grilled chicken and wanting to eat healthy but then they're they are swayed by the uh craveable uh beautiful uh creative print that we have <laughs> well and the fact that it tastes really good yeah and, and you know it's it's funny that or sad or whatever that when uh regular consumers are surveyed about what they want to eat they're like yeah I obviously want to eat more healthfully and, and all of that. And then they go into a restaurant and they say, yeah, I need some fried chicken and mac and cheese and, you know, some either sugar sweetened soda or a shake. And that's what they order. So that's, but it's, I, it's nice that you have goat chicken on the menu and some people I'm sure eat it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, that's the number one. I, actually, I was at the dentist this morning and, and my dentist is like, yeah, you guys need more healthy options. <laughs> and and we know that, right? Uh, we know younger customers are looking for it. And so we're, we're working on that. Well, I mean, I think your response could be, are you going to eat them though? Because, you know, we put them <laughs> on the menu and then nobody gets them. But are, is that something that you're working on? Yeah, well, I mean, we're unapologetic about the fact that our menu is very indulgent, right? Um, but we also have to have that balance, not only for our customers, but for our crew members that are eating our food and working in our restaurants every day. We've got to take care of them, too. So can you share some of what might be in the pipeline, or is it all secret? Yeah, so, um, you know, I would just say that we've uh, we've been doing a lot of work to um, attract newer, younger customers, um, you know, strategically, uh, we've been focused on, um, you know, sandwiches, um, indulgent treats. Um, so a couple of fun things that we have coming up from on the breakfast front, uh, we're launching a sausage bowberry biscuit and, uh, bowberry biscuits have been on our menu for a long time, but, uh, we're putting a new twist on it and, uh, it's a sweet and savory experience our sausage is very it's whole hog sausage it's very sage forward uh really good country sausage and um and then we're putting uh, a, a a a glaze on top of that in between the bowberry biscuit and uh yeah it's something that you can hack on our menu today and we have had customers hacking it and some of the reviews are you know people are pounding the roof of their car as they eat it because it's so good <laughs> so um yeah didn't go ahead a hack like that go viral like wasn't there like a sportscaster or something like that so, somewhere in there South was that was something similar yeah it was called the the uva from columbia south carolina right uh, yeah, uva was, was, mike, the, was the guy yeah mike uva correct and it did go viral he had a cajun fillet uh on on a bowberry biscuit with uh with egg and cheese, I want to say, but uh, yeah, 
hey, we're here for our fans. You know, we're here to give them what they want. Oh, absolutely. Um, Something else that's going to be fun coming out um, is uh, we've got Bird Dogs launching soon. Um, not sure if you're familiar with that, but it's basically a hot dog uh, with chicken instead of uh, instead of the hot dog and, and um, fried chicken tender, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah, we're using our our chicken supremes and uh, a Carolina Gold sauce. Um, you know, it's it's a Carolina born flavor profile. Um, with our flavorful chicken, uh, crispy and delicious, and our thick-cut uh, dill pickles. Although Good Carolina, Carolina Gold is a South Carolina style of uh, barbecue, right? It is. It is specific to South Carolina, but it's a flavor profile that um, everybody loves. Um, when we, What we found is that it, it transcends no matter where you are in the country. Um, another fun item that's going to be coming out soon is a bowberry cookie. Um, you know, we've embraced the the cult following we have for bowberries, and so uh, in our expansion markets, we actually have a bowberry milkshake. Um, we've got the bowberry sausage biscuit, and now we're going to be bringing in uh, bowberry cookies. And um, you know, if if the uh, the initial testing is any indication of how it's going to do, we think this one's going to go viral as well. Fantastic, and and is. Bowberry different from blueberry, or is it just what you guys call blueberry? Yeah, yeah, bowberry. It's it's unique to Bojangles, and uh, you know it's our own flavor profile that we've created, and it is really good. So it's blueberries that are flavored somehow, or something like that, or is that all <laughs> you can't say? <laughs> it's our it's a magical bowberry. We like okay. to we like to say that you know it's it's harvested in the winter time. Uh, you know. <laughs> It's really good. By elves or something like that. <laughs> Thinking Smurfs. Uh, oh, yeah. That would make sense. H how about uh, in terms of beverage, speaking of things that go viral? Because like, people go nuts, on the, uh, especially on TikTok. They like throw their beverage, and it's, it seems to be part of their identity, which I don't fully understand. But I'm not the target market, so it doesn't really matter. Do you do, are you doing much with beverages? We are. Um, we we have a really good iced coffee program in our expansion markets. With um, it's available with sweet cream, French vanilla, or um, uh, and then or just plain old black, and um, that's been really well received. Um, we also have milkshakes. We're offering French vanilla, chocolate, bowberry, um, and then we have premium lemonade and. Um, it's just good down home southern lemonade uh, that tastes like it was, you know, fresh squeezed by your grandma. Um, it's got the pulp. It's it's just everything that you you would want to pair with fried chicken. Um, and then we steep our sweet tea. Our sweet tea is legendary, right? Like people travel from across the country to come enjoy our sweet tea, and uh, you know we steep it like grandma would on the farm, right? I mean, it's 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 an old technique but it's tried and true and people reward us for for taking that extra time and love and putting it into the, the beverage that's that's cool so you said you're adding new items uh as you expand what what are new markets that you're going into so um we just announced that we're launching in phoenix um we're going into las vegas uh and nevada um today we're we've we've begun opening in texas uh san antonio houston dallas um and then as far north as ohio and uh soon to be new jersey great i'm in new york so i mean i'm probably not going to go to new jersey to get some chicken but maybe as i said i will change planes in charlotte if i can soon um, my friend will be coming to you thank you i appreciate that uh, so you're creating these new items for new markets. Are they then coming back to your existing markets? They Those... are where it makes sense, right? Um, you know, we've we've got to make sure that we um, continue to give our current customers what they're looking for, um, and while also attracting new customers. So we're you know we have to find that balance. Sure. Um... So it sounds like the menus might be pretty different in different parts of the country. Is that a concern in terms of branding and stuff? 
Yeah, and we are on a path to uh, get to one menu, one brand, right? Um, but yeah, so you're going to notice that the chicken is all hand breaded in these expansion markets. And uh, eventually, you know, who knows? I, I can't predict the future, but I know our we're going to listen to our customers. If they tell us that they want it, then we're going to give our customers what they want. You guys also tested wings, right? Is that right? We have tested wings recently and uh, it's done incredibly well for us. Um, so we're excited to bring those back. Um, you know, we, we look at that as, uh, you know, something with uh, that really just makes sense for our brand. We've always been a uh, tailgating brand. Um, you know, we have the big bow box and people, you know, take the big bow box with them to football games. And it's just, it's really cool to see in the parking lot, you know, you see the big bow boxes are out on people's tables and, um, you know, wings are just a natural fit to, to get, bring new news to our tailgating culture. So do you, I know you can't predict the future, but you do have an idea of your menu pipeline. So like, is, is that going to be a, like a rotating LTO for football season or something that might be permanent or like what, what, how do you foresee chicken wings for Bojangles? Yeah, it could be. Um, you know, I think chicken wings, I mean, chicken on the bone, like people are always going to eat that way. Uh, and yeah, I, I definitely see us doing some fun things with chicken wings in the future. Uh, it's, it, I'm a chicken wing connoisseur, so I'm excited about it. Uh, and, you know, we know from our recent uh, test with wings that our, our fans are also equally excited. And how about boneless wings? A misnomer that I don't enjoy because it's chicken breast. But like, is that something you guys <laughs> play with? Yeah, we've definitely talked about it. Um, you know, I think we just want to establish ourselves as a um, you know a, a go-to place for tailgating um, with bone-in chicken and chicken wings. And uh, I could see us going down the the path, um, but we'll do it in a if we do go down the boneless chicken route. We're going to do it in a way that is authentic to our Carolina born brand. Authentic Carolina boneless wings. I mean, you know, traditions evolve over time. <laughs> I, I was, I just uh, attended the live report being recording of uh, a, another food podcast that pointed out that pasta has only been mainstream in Italy for like a hundred years, you know, so traditions can be created. And uh, as long as they're sort of true to the communities that they're in, is is the uh, North Carolina branding messaging thing is is that an important part of the Bojangles message as it goes to places like Las Vegas where they might not care whether it's from North Carolina or not, or maybe they do care. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think you know when I hear the. the when I hear Carolina, I, I do think that um, people think of uh, good food. You know, it's they see Carolina cooking techniques embraced by chefs all over the country. Um, really, the South in general, right? We've seen a huge resurgence of Southern cuisine in the last 15 years popping up and all over the country. And chefs, chefs have taken notice of the fact that Southern food is just really craveable. It's it's fun to cook and people love it. So that's why I think it's a trend that's here to stay. Yeah, I mean, I certainly have enjoyed eating Southern food. It, it When I'm in the South, like the food tastes like people cooked it intentionally. Like they, they wanted you to enjoy it. It's coming from a place of love and they're just really like making sure that it's delicious, which I've always appreciated about the South. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we're about out of time, but do you have some parting thoughts on what the future of food at Bojangles is going to look like? Yeah. You know, I like to say that our culinary North Star is being authentically Southern with a modern twist. And I think what you can expect to see from us is, um, you know, scratch batch cooking, um, you know, handcrafted, you know, that, that, uh, the care and, and the preparation that you just mentioned, um, you know, we're going to continue to embrace that. And, um, you know, I think you're going to see a lot more activity uh, as we 
uh, give our customers what they've been asking for, uh, especially younger audiences um, in terms of snacking and, um, you know, delicious beverages, refreshing beverages, um, unexpected breakfast sandwiches, and, you know, coming on those delicious made from scratch buttermilk biscuits. Um, and uh, yeah, we're just, we're going to have some fun with it. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens. I'm looking forward to you coming to a market near me. And uh, good luck and enjoy the rest of the year. Maybe I'll see you in, South, in uh, North Carolina soon. Yeah, great. Give us a shout. Thanks, Brett. Belgioso Cheese is a family-owned and operated company specializing in artisan Italian cheese making. Using only natural ingredients and fresh local Wisconsin milk, master cheesemakers handcraft a full line of exceptional cheeses guided by a commitment to quality and a respect for tradition. Ask your distributor about Belgioso's award-winning fresh mozzarella, burrata, ricotta, mascarpone, American grana, and parmesan. At Belgioso, every cheese is a specialty.